Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, welcome. We had a great birthday. That means me. <laughs> when I say we, that means me. One time, we used to use the word we for everything in the monastery. We'd say, we're doing this, and we're doing that. And so one time, I went to a dentist. And I said, boy, we have a sore truth. <laughs> and uh, he said, how many are you? <laughs> And I, oh, I didn't catch on. You know, I really didn't catch on what he was talking because it's such a habit with us. And and I said, how many are we? Oh, see, it was in Canton, Ohio. It was about now 24, I think. There. He said, you all have a toothache. I said, no, just me. He said, but you said we. And I said, oh, no, no, that just means me. So me and we had a great birthday. <laughs> and I want to thank you for all your cards and, and all your, your flowers, yellow flowers. They were wonderful. And they're everywhere. Every statue has a bouquet. and every, They're all over the chapel. It was wonderful. And I really enjoyed being 78. I guess the, some of it is that everybody says, I don't look it, and that makes you feel better, you know. <laughs> but I really don't care because I don't care how I f look. I just want to live as long as I can. You say, why do you want to do that? Because I think old age is a blessing. And not too many people agree with me. But I really do because Every day, you learn something more about God. You have maybe a different cross to bear. And as you get older, you realize that the body, well, I don't want to compare it with a car, but you have a lot of miles on you, you know? <laughs> and just like a car, it parts, parts, wear down. Somewhere out. Uh, this morning I noticed one of my toes. <laughs> half of it is old and the other half pretty good. <laughs> and I thought, now how could I have a half old toe and one a good, the other half good? I don't know. I'll have to add somebody sometime how that happens. But it's a wonderful thing. I learned something awesome about God on Sunday because of that great, great privilege the Lord gave us on Mercy Sunday. I hope everybody got it. And I don't think anyone would have imagined that God would have done such a wonderful thing for us, sinners that we are. You say, well, what was so wonderful? Well what God did on Sunday, and we'll do every Mercy Sunday from now on, but that's once a year, but that's okay with me. What he did, that if you went to confession last week and you went to communion Sunday, anytime Sunday, every sin, 
every imperfection, every weakness was like pushed in the ocean of God's mercy. It's gone. Everybody has a few skeletons in their closet. You wives be happy you don't know who your husband's skeletons are. And you husbands be happy you don't know who your wife's skeletons are. You say, we don't have any skeletons. Oh, come on. Everybody has a skeleton somewhere. Everyone. I got enough in my relationships to be a, make an interesting book. <laughs> so we all have something. But it's gone. That's why I liked the Sunday. I had all of our sisters just had the most wonderful day. Because we would have never dreamed of God's generosity. And if you couldn't go, or you didn't go, or you wanted to go, our Lord would have given it to you. If you can't, then oh, wait till next year and I'll bug you again. Because I want everybody in this whole white world that sees either EWTN or WEWN or internet, whatever. And our, our Lord told our good friend, Frank Fasina, that he said to her, I want you to tell the whole world about this wonderful gift because this will enable them to accept my coming. Wow. You know, we've been listening about his coming for years. I've been telling you for years. And most of you have said, there she goes again. <laughs> and I'm going to keep on and get it again. Because I can't wait. You say, well, how's he going to come? I don't know. Just the idea is enough for me. And that's why he wants us cleaned up now. You can still go to confession. And I urge you to. I urge you to. Please don't forget this network. It costs two million three hundred thousand a month to break even. Just to break even. Now, some of you out there, I would like to put a guilt trip on you. <laughs> because some of you have never given, and you could. I mean, you could give a hunk, and you wouldn't even miss it. And I know you're not going to take it with you. <laughs> I guarantee you're not going to take it with you. Besides, your whole family is going to fight over it. They are. They are going to fight, and those who have been friends are going to become enemies. And they'll watch every penny, and if, I, if, if somebody else gets five cents more than they get, finished. Now, I got a solution for the whole thing. <laughs> See, give everybody the same, and don't worry about it. You're not going to have to go over it. You're going to be either there or in the middle. I call that purgatory. I hope you never go down. And although that is funny, it is serious because people don't talk to each other for years over wills and stuff. It's just no good. But I, I'm just kidding over that. But I just please remember. Our dear Lord has provided for this network for 20 years. On August 15th, it'll be 20 years. Isn't that awesome? It's all because of you. Nobody else. Every day the sisters open the mail, read your letters, pray for you, and count the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the process. <laughs> now, you can't have it any other way. So I just wanted you to know, since somebody brought it up, it was me, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, I was surprised that in one country in this world, there are 60% who do not believe in the resurrection. <clears throat> 
Well, if you don't believe in the resurrection, your faith is dead. It doesn't even exist. Like St. Paul said, if, you're, if, if he had not risen, then your faith is useless. Jesus was not just a prophet. Have you ever thought, one of my favorite hobbies, I call it a hobby, anything you'd like to do becomes a hobby. I have a little favorite spiritual hobby, and I look through the scriptures, Old, New and Old Testament, trying to find those things about God that would be hard for Jesus as man. That, that, that sounds kind of complicated. For example, just imagine you had the IQ of 20 Einsteins. I mean, you'd be bright, to say the least. Would you be comfortable talking to first graders. What would you talk about? They're looking at you, looking at what you got to eat. <laughs> you want to pay sandcastles in the sand? <laughs> sandcastles. Now remember, the IQ of 10 Einsteins, and, and you're dealing and living and talking to kitties. Kids, you say, well, that would be terrible. Oh, it's nothing compared to what Jesus had to suffer. He's talking to apostles, future apostles, but this is God. You see, we don't understand what it means to be God. Infinite intellect. And, and he never was, he was always, he was, there was never a time he was not. Ooh, tackle that one. There was never a time God was not. They used to gripe my mother, awful. Who made God? I said, nobody made God. He always was. But I mean, I know that, but how, how, how did he get to where he is? He was always there. I don't understand. I neither do I. So why can't you just take it? But I just want to know who made it. Jeez. <laughs> Those kind of questions to an Italian are drastic. Are terrible. <laughs> just terrible because there's no answer. And you don't want it to have an answer. Because if somebody made him, that person would have to be greater, you see, and there's no one greater than God. So imagine that intellect dealing with you and me. And he dealt with apostles that were all fishermen. I'm not against fishermen. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want all kind of letters from fishermen's wives. <laughs> Fishermen will laugh about it, but not their wives. <laughs> hmm. So just imagine that if you can. Can you imagine that kind of God retaining his divinity and his intellect and his knowledge and his power in the womb of a woman ever so small? You can imagine that. That had to be a suffering. Gone through a process he created. Ooh. See, and then to be born. Now you're God and, and, and you have power, unbelievable power. And you're in a smelly staple. Staple. I know, because we used to have sheep. Whew. Those days, we didn't have too many people coming here. <laughs> oh, 
always wondered why it increased when we gave them away. <laughs> but when you love animals, you never smell anything. I learned that, you know, <laughs> because they're so wonderful. You like them. But imagine this awesome God. You know, I, I was reading, I like to read things on, on how big the stars and the quasars and all are, are, how big they are. And, you know, this one is a hundred times larger than the earth. I mean, it boggles your mind. He created all that. And then he said, little boy, I had to be a suffering. I had to be a pain of some kind. Probably wasn't, maybe it was physical, who knows? Learning to walk. Oh, you know, when you go down the life of Jesus on that level, you realize he suffered from day one, meaning incarnation to, to death on the cross. You know, there's nothing so hard, and I know you've all had your, most of you are parents, and you've had to explain different things to your children, and you did your best. And after you spend an hour, they look at you and say, I don't understand. <laughs> you ever have that happen? Huh? Yeah, you do. But that's what Jesus did. You say, well, I didn't think God could suffer. He suffered for us. That was real suffering on that cross. He wasn't pretending. You see, God in his, God divinity doesn't suffer, but that suffering of his body, and he was God-man, was as hard and harsh as man could impose. Why though? You see, in the garden, in the garden, our dear Lord didn't ask, he didn't say, let this chalice pass from me, meaning he wasn't trying to get out of something. Oh, no, he wanted that. What he was asking was, well, can't all men be saved? After I go through all of this, can every man be saved? Can the adulterers and drunks and drug addicts and the indifferent and the lukewarm and the worldly, can't they all be saved? Well, they can, and he wants them to. What do you want after all that suffering and pain of a God-man? What do you want? when it was all for you. Now the apostles were chosen by God. And you wonder why, don't you? Because they weren't too bright. They didn't understand the simplest parable. Not the simplest, like the sower went out to sow his seeds. Well, that's simple. And he sowed his seed, and some was on rocky ground, and some was on good ground, and that's, don't you think that's simple? Huh? You all think that's simple? Yeah. They didn't understand. They waited till they got in the house at night, nobody around. They said, Master, what was that about the sower and the seed? You say, well, they were fishermen. Well, I'm neither one, but I know what he meant. They didn't. I mean, he got a tremendous truth down to a level of a second grader. But they didn't understand. Don't you think that's a suffering? I do. And then even after the resurrection, he's with them 40 days. He's about to ascend to his father, and they said, Master, Will you now restore the kingdom of Israel? Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> I mean, what's it going to take? Let's go over some of the places here in the Matthew's Gospel about the resurrection. <laughs> oh, boy. 
I hate to tell you, man, but you didn't do too hot. <laughs> you really didn't. Okay. It says here that after the first day of the week, towards the dawn, Mary Magdala and the other Marys. Now, Mary Magdala was right under that cross. But they all got the same message three times. He said, I will go to Jerusalem. I will be uh, crucified, and I will die on the third day. I will rise. Is that clear to you? Yeah? You all heard that? You did. Ah, uh, they all heard it. Not one person believed it. Not one of them. It says here, oh, I want to prove something I've been saying for weeks. And all at once, there was a violent earthquake. <laughs> oh, I think that's great. <coughs> you see how desperate God is to wake you up? We're not listening. We are not listening. So now there was not only a violent earthquake when he was dying, there was a violent, did you hear that? A violent earthquake. When the poor women, they already had a hard day. Then the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone. The angels don't do anything quiet. Wow, boy, that stone, I bet it flew three miles. <laughs> it says here, I ain't not making it up. Matthew 28. Thought I'd sound like a good Baptist. <laughs> and there are a lot of them here, I love them all. <laughs> they can quote you scripture before you can sneeze. <laughs> Shame on all you Catholics. <laughs> okay, so now, this angel, I thought he, he's really my kind of angel. You know what he did? His face was like lightning, and when he rolled back that stone, he sat on it. <laughs> like, so much for you. <laughs> now, this is a big stone. You're not talking about a little peated, you know. You're talking about a big, big rock. So he pow, it sounds like an earthquake. It's not these little creepy angels that the New Agers put out everywhere, you know. Woo, woo, woo. I wouldn't fuss with an angel, I can tell you that. His face was like lightning. His robe, white as snow. Here, these little women, I mean, they're just scared to death. The guards <laughs> were so shaken and so frightened that they were like dead men. Well, that's pretty good for the women. At least they were standing. <laughs> then the angel spoke. He said, there's no need for you to be afraid. Well, I think there was, don't you? Well, I think that I would have been scared. Everybody would. You know, it's not an, an ordinary day occurrence that somebody's gravestone is going to be rolled back and this angel sit on it. And I think, but see, those up there don't think like we do. They don't. He said, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said he would. I hope I'm reaching some of you people out there who have been told, or you think, that he didn't rise. Hmm. I wish this angel would shake you up a little bit, because <laughs> you need it bad. Come and see the place where they laid him. But go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen. And he's going before you to Galilee. Well, to say they were filled with awe, something else. 
Well, they ran to the apostles. And they didn't believe him. I'm glad I wasn't one of those women. I've thought at least five or six things I could have done that these women didn't do. What an opportunity they missed. <laughs> now, I'm going to skip the poor Pharisees and Sadducees who told the guards that, uh, you know, the guards said, we were there, and here comes this being, and he rolls back the stone, and the man inside that was dead is risen. And we're petrified. And they say, oh, no, no, don't say that. And we're going to give you a lot of money. That's what it says here. And you just keep quiet. And then, now these are guards stationed to be sure nobody touches the tomb or the grave. And then if somebody says, where is he? Say, well, his, his, um, his followers came during the night and took him away. What? You're supposed to be there guarding it, and you saw them come and take him away? Where were you? David would have said, lop off his head. He had a habit of saying, lop off, you know. <laughs> Did you ever read about St. David in the Old Testament? You know, the man that brought him news about Saul's death and Jonathan, and he said, lop his head off, you know, <laughs> just like that, see? Well, that's what they should say, they gave him money. That, that doesn't sound right, does it? Now, I'm going over to another one here. See, people don't all react the same to great things or spiritual things. But my friends, <laughs> this life is extremely short. The life you're going to live forever is there or there. And at this point, it's spiritual. But when the great day comes, not the one our Lord is talking about for now around the corner, but the final day, which probably you and I won't see, your body's going to be reunited to the soul you think you don't have. That's going to be a mighty awakening, but at the wrong time. Now, you're either going to look like the ugliest, ugliest, ugliest being that ever happened to be, or you're going to be beautiful. Now, make a choice, now. I mean, you know, the devil's in hell that I were human. I still gonna be human at the general resurrection. They're gonna come along ugly, grossly ugly, repulsively ugly. You wanna do that? Gotta have enough vanity to at least they look good after you're dead. <laughs> I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. You want to be beautiful, more beautiful than you ever were on. You think that Mother Teresa, for example, has wrinkles in heaven? No, she looks young and beautiful. The cripple won't be crippled, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and they'll be beautiful. Everybody will be beautiful because the radiance of God will shine through your soul in heaven and shine to your body and soul after we're all raised from the dead. Now, I know some of you smarties out there say, oh, there she believes all that stuff. That isn't stuff. It's what you're going to face when you drop dead, which might be tomorrow. You don't know, and I don't know. <sighs> now, you want to look like the ugliest human being that ever lived. 
If that's what you're going to, this is the honest to goodness truth. The church teaches that. You think only the good are going to rise? Oh, no. You won't be together, I can tell you that. You're going to have your own ugly world. And the worst penance, the worst pain you're going to have, you're going to have to look at Satan forever. Oh, I hope that scares hell out of you. <laughs> I hope it, something scares it out of you. Now, I would. <laughs> you know why everybody laughs? Because they don't expect me to say it. <laughs> it was like the night. Oh, Jesus. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why it said it, but I did. You know, it just came to my head. I didn't mean to say it. We, I don't know. I was t doing a takeoff on doctors. And I said, can you imagine this one doctor asked me to, to drink 15 glasses of water a day? I said, I'd be like a dog at a fire hydrant. I I just about died after I said it. <laughs> I asked the producer if she wanted to erase it. She said, no, it's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> anyway, now if you look at St. John's Gospel, uh, we find our dear Lord risen, and, and we find Mary Magdalene there. You know what's so awesome, well, everything is awesome about the crucifixion. There was the Immaculate One, the one who never sinned. Mary, our mother. There was John, the beloved one, the chaste one. And then there was two thieves one rebellious and the other repentant. The man was rude, the rebellious thief was rude and caustic and arrogant. You're, so, you're the Lord, why don't you let us all down and prove it? Something happened to the other thief. I think it was Our Lady's prayers. Because he said, you and I deserve what we have. This man did nothing. And then he said something strange. He said, Lord, he knew, recognized him in the cross. He did. And I wonder sometimes, do I recognize Jesus from my cross? Do we recognize Jesus on his cross? Do we recognize Jesus in our crosses? Well, the Lord looked at him because he said, Lord, remember me when you get into your kingdom. Now look what he said, called him Lord and realized he was going into a kingdom he didn't ask for entrance. He just said, remember me. See, that's what happened on Sunday, this last Sunday, that Mercy Sunday. I want you all to think about the mercy of God. And no matter how rotten you've been, no matter what a sinner you've been, no matter what crimes you have committed, the mercy of God is greater than anything you could do. He's ready always to forgive and forget. Well, the Lord, the merciful Jesus, who had no mercy given to him at all, he died for a lie. They said he, he mocked 
God by saying he would destroy this temple in three days, raise it up. Well, he did raise it up. And so there you got three sinners, great singers, the mother of God and a holy apostle. That's all he had to show after 33 years. What was in that 33 years that was so great? 30 of them he was silent and alone and unnoticed by anyone. Obviously he spent it with his mother, training her, teaching her. The three years that he worked and healed and did everything for, for you and I and for the people there, there wasn't one of those. There was no leper there that he healed. There wasn't the blind. There wasn't the deaf. All the people he healed and raised from the dead, including Lazarus, none of them was there. None of them. How sad. How sad. Well, he did all of that for you. And then the earth quaked again. You see? Now, if you don't believe that he is God, only God, only a man, God could suffer that. And when the centurion put a lance into his heart, what came out? A little blood, a little water. No one could say seven words in a loud voice with a few drops of blood in them. He had to be kept up by the Holy Spirit, by his own divinity. You, you just lose a certain amount of blood, you pass out. You couldn't live with a drop of blood and a drop of water in your heart. He loved us so much, he extended his life miraculously so he could give every drop for you and me. Wouldn't you think you would believe that? I am understand Christians, so-called, not believing in his resurrection. That I don't understand. Well, all of a sudden there is two angels sitting where the body of Jesus had been. <laughs> One at the head and the other at the feet. <laughs> <coughs> now, the angels and Jesus himself always use a, sentence, a little word called why. <laughs> Your kids do that when they're young. Don't go out, it's raining. Why? <laughs> Be home by 9 o'clock. Why? Don't cut your hair that short. Why? Well, he said, woman, why are you weeping? Now, don't you think she had reason to cry? Huh? She said, she didn't even look up. She said, they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Oh. And she said that she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Isn't that strange? You've been with someone so long, and you don't know it. Why, you don't expect him to be in a risen body. They didn't know what be raised from the dead man. Well, she said, sir, she didn't know. 
Sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you put him and I'll go and remove him. Can you imagine a woman removing a dead body? See, real love doesn't think straight. You can't, because all she wanted to know, somebody took him away. And Jesus looked at her and said, Mary, can you imagine for a moment? Maybe some of you tonight have lost a loved one. Buried. Knock, right, you're risen now. And you hear a knock on your door. And you say, come in. You could care less who it is. Care less. You hear steps. But you don't see anybody. And from behind you, you hear. Mary, ah, oh, that voice is familiar. Wow. And then you see Jesus. I think you had a right to be scared. Most women would faint dead away. But they didn't. Now, Jesus said to her, though, before this, Woman, why are you weeping? See, that's so awesome. Well, she knew him then, and, and he said to her in Hebrew, Rabboni. She couldn't believe it. And she said, do not cling to me. I can see Mary Magdalene. Oh, you know, it had to be unbelievable. He knew if she ever hugged him, that was at least a three-hour session. <laughs> you remember when her, her sister was making dinner? Well, she just sat there. She could care less whether the Gavalta fish was there or not. <laughs> so he told her, don't cling to me, because I have not yet ascended to my father. But go and find the brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my father and your father. Your father, all of you. To my God and your God. My surprise is that she went. Most women would have talked him out of it. <laughs> That's the way we are. But she went. But they didn't believe her. Today, my friends, we have many signs, many signs. And when our dear Lord said he wanted to give everyone that total, total merciful forgiveness of every sin, fault, weakness, last Sunday, so that they would be prepared for his coming. Now, we're not talking about the end of the world. One of these days, I'm going to have a guest that's going to explain that. A kind of intermediate, intermediate coming. <coughs> Something. <coughs> that we and I will see. I don't know about me, I'm 78. But I'll see it here or there. But we shall all see it. How wonderful. You know, I felt so sorry for Jesus last Sunday. Because I know that everybody didn't hear about that wonderful gift and grace. I know many people were prevented from having it, 
and many people couldn't and many, many didn't care. I felt sorry for it. It's like making a wonderful lemon pie for your husband, your wife, your, your children, or a big roast. It looks good, smells good, and everybody comes in, every single one. And they all have a place to go. They're all in a hurry. And somebody says, what's for dinner? And you say, roast in this one, before you can explain it. So I don't have time, Mom. I got to run. Another one comes in, and it says, hi, Mom. I'm on the run. Another comes in and says, I don't know. I don't feel good today. I feel kind of nauseated. I'm going to bed. What a terrible thing. Your husband comes home and says, well, we got roast again. <laughs> That's why I never got married. <laughs> that would have never worked for me. <laughs> never. <laughs> But I just want you to see, I know my, my examples are not too good, but that's all I can think of. But he had to feel bad. He can't do any more for us. The Eucharist alone is something we can be grateful for forever. Giving us his own mother, another gift, we are too busy to bother with. And then to have all of our sins. If I died tonight, I would only go to purgatory for two days sins. <laughs> I don't know what I could do in two days. Well, I know what I could do in two days, but I didn't do that much, I don't think. That's the kind of gift we would have had on Sunday, but we'll, I'll see that you get it next year, by golly. If I have to start in December. <sighs> if he comes, and I hope he does, don't be afraid. We have a call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hi, where, how are you? Good. I just wanted to congratulate you on your uh, 20 years of service. <laughs> Thank you. 20 Nearly years. 20 years. Yeah. And my question is about uh, Holy Communion. Yeah. Um, the Church teaches uh, on the divine indwelling of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if he is living on the inside of every man, um, wh why is it required that we go and receive him over and over again on Sunday? It's like receiving something that we already have living on the inside of us. Oh, no, my friend. No, 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 no. Uh, the you, uh, it, your divine indwelling in you comes to you from baptism. His presence is there in baptism, in essence, as his presence is everywhere. Everywhere, or nothing would exist, nothing. But he is transcendent. He transcends everything he makes. And so his grace, St. Peter, if you read St. Peter's first uh, epistle, his grace, that grace that comes to you from communion is a participation. That's what grace means, a participation in the divine nature of God. That helps me to change my evil ways into God-like ways. But Holy Communion is, I do not become God when I, when I, the fact that he lives in me to preserve me and to make me holy. But Holy Communion, chapter six of St. John's Gospel is entirely different. It is the real presence, body, blood, soul and divinity 
I go every day. I'd go ten times a day if I could. You're talking about something so elevated. There's a great difference. Because in that Eucharist is the divine nature. Not a piece, it's part of the grace. It is God himself. That's why he said, I will not leave you orphans. That's what's so awesome about the Eucharist. And in our chapel, we have him exposed all day and all night, and we've done it for 120 years. There's a grave difference, my friend. And I pray that God will give you that grace to see, to see that awesome presence, real. He's there. Now communion, you see, a lot depends on your faith and, and a lot depends on your belief. A lot depends on how you were 20 minutes before you receive communion, it's especially the new age where you don't have to go to confession. I can tell you, buddy, go. <laughs> go. Because you're very wrong, and somebody has told you a grave error. There's a great difference. One is a real presence, and one a sanctifying presence that makes you become more and more like Jesus. That's why we kneel. That's why I don't kneel. There will come a day when you will kneel, and they will kneel in heaven, on earth, and in hell. They will kneel at the presence of Jesus. That's how it's going to be. I wrote, the Lord gave me a book on the Eucharist. I'd be glad to send it to you. The name of it is To Leave and Yet to Stay. It's a little book, a booklet, I suppose. But he did the impossible. He left and he stayed. God's presence in you depends entirely upon your remaining in sanctifying grace. You sin and out he goes. Because the devil and God cannot reside in the same place. But the real presence doesn't depend on you. You need him. And in this awesome book on chapter 6, it says, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. But if you don't believe that, I would have to question if you believe the scriptures at all. We can take some of the scriptures and say, I, this is not a book for a cafeteria. You take it all. You're going to miss something very important. I suggest you read chapter 6. And then pray a little bit and ask yourself a question. Did he tell the truth or did he lie? Well, God cannot lie. In fact, if you read St. John's uh, Gospel, you'll read, read his epistles also. He says, and it happens today often, the one who says there is no sin calls God a liar. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that at all. So now when you read chapter 6 of John's God's Paul, be careful. Be very careful that you don't call 
God, a liar. Well, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's about time, huh? Mm. I hate to leave you with a swallow of water, but I don't have a choice, you know? I love you. But remember and never forget, God loves you, knows you, protects you, provides for you, and cares for you. See you tomorrow. Bye now.